I would find a great help if you want to keep your uh, Bible open or your phone open, as long as you're not on Facebook or anything, uh, unless you're at home, obviously, if you're at home on Facebook Live, it's great that you're on that. Um, but do keep your Bible um, open. Also, just to say that the youngsters, um, I know when you came in, you were given a various activity sheets uh, to try and help you engage in different parts of the service. So I did say that um, when you get to page two, page two is when there are some extra items there to help you engage with this particular bit of the service, uh, things to listen out for, to fill in. And this is a chance, if you are with your mom or dad or whoever brought you today, you're allowed to nudge them, you're allowed to ask them for some help as you try and fill in different parts of that activity sheet. But with God's word open before us, let's pray. Let's pray that the Holy Spirit would help us understand and to see wonderful things about Jesus uh, so that we can live our lives in the next few days differently as a result of what the Bible says today. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your book, the Bible, that you've written it, that it's true, it's accurate, and it is deeply relevant for our lives. So help us to listen up and to put into practice quickly uh, what you say as we gaze at the beauty of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, do you know what happened on the 14th of April, 1912, just before midnight? Now, you may want to whisper that to the person next to you. Maybe it's already in your head. What happened? Well, on the 12th of April, an enormous ocean liner called the Titanic set sail on its maiden voyage voyage from Southampton, and it was on its way to New York. And when it set sail from Southampton, it had loud cheering, celebration. However, only two days later, a disaster struck. The unsinkable ship, as it was coined, hit an enormous iceberg and quickly sank to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Now, I imagine that on the 12th of April, when it set sail from Southampton, there were many different kind of lists on board the ship. For example, here are a few different options, I think. There would have been lists of different passengers, wouldn't they, on the ship? A list of first-class passengers, a list of second-class passengers. They even had third-class passengers uh, back then. Uh, there would have been a list of the crew who were on board the ship. And the crew would have been categorized according to their ranking. And um, maybe even there would have been lists of all the different food and drink that had been packed on board this enormous boat. But on the morning of the 15th of April, 1912, there were only two lists that mattered. The list of those who were saved and the list of those who were lost. Now, in our world, there are all sorts of lists, aren't they, that you can try and get your name on. Uh, here are a few examples of maybe the l kind of list that you would like to get your name on. For example, the list of the richest people in the world. Now, if you are on that list, by the way, do come and chat to me afterwards. I can give you a giving uh, leaflet. That would be very helpful. Uh, what else? You could be, um, want to be on the list of the top universities in the country. Maybe your great ambition uh, is to go to one of the universities in the top 10 in the country. So you can get the certificate on the wall and say, I have been there. Or maybe you want to be on the list of the most beautiful people in town. I don't think there is an official list, is there, of the most beautiful people in Scarborough. But you know what I mean. Maybe your real desire is to, to look so beautiful that you feel at ease in your own skin. And as you walk around, uh, you like the fact that people turn their heads when you walk past. Or maybe it is you just want to be on the list of the most popular people in school. You want to fit in. Well, today I want to show us from the Bible that even though our world is full of so many so-called important lists, ultimately only two lists matter. The list of those who are saved eternally and the list of those who suffer eternally. Those are the only two lists, ultimately, that matter. Now, over the last few weeks, if you've been uh, with us at church, we've been going through different chapters of the book of Daniel, and at different points, 
we've, we've looked at different historical references as we have opened up the book of Daniel. So we've looked at the Babylonian Empire. That was a real empire. We've looked at the Persian Empire. We've looked at the Greek Empire. We've looked at the Roman Empire. All these empires predicted uh, before they happened, actually, in the Bible. But now as we reach Daniel chapter 12, the camera shifts. Uh, the camera shifts to the future, to the very end of human history. Now, if you've got your Bibles open, have a look at verse 1 of Daniel chapter 12. Let me read it to you. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Listen to this. Some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, I guess many of us don't really have any time, do we, to, to give any thought to how we think the world will end. So many of us at this time particularly, we're just so busy trying to survive the moment. <laughs> the, the chance of actually lying back in your sofa considering, hmm, I wonder how the world will end. Will we just like get bored? Will we be hit by a meteorite? Whatever it might be. We don't really have time for that sort of question. But let me tell you a biblical truth this morning, a biblical fact. The world as we know it will end. But the world that we know and the world that we experience will only end when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. So the same Jesus Christ who was here 2,000 years ago, the Bible says he is coming back at one point in the future. He will return again. And when he does, it will be very different than before. Uh, when he came 2,000 years ago and was born as a baby, it was very quiet. It was very hidden. But in the future, the Bible says that when Jesus comes back, it will be loud. It will be dramatic. And it will be unmissable. Now, when Jesus returns again, lots of incredible things will happen. But this morning, I just want to focus on one thing. The one thing we're told about in verse 2 of Daniel chapter 12. Listen again. Multitudes, we're told, this will happen at the time of Jesus' return. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, it is wrong to say that if you want to live forever, you should become a Christian. Uh, that's not true. See, according to the Bible... Everyone will live forever. The only question is, where? Everyone's going to live forever. The only question is, where are we going to live for eternity? Or in the words of Daniel chapter 12, at some point in the future, when Jesus returns, people will either rise to everlasting life or rise to everlasting shame. Now, what this means is that not everybody's going to be waved through heavenly passport control. I don't think there is such a thing as heavenly passport control, but if there was, it's not that we're all going to arrive and there's going to be no, no border controls and we're all just going to be waved through. According to this bit of the Bible, at the great return of Jesus, there will be a great separation. Everyone who has ever lived will rise from the grave. Uh, do you know what the word cemetery means? Uh, the word cemetery means a, sl a sleeping place, literally. Uh, where the bodies sleep because at some point the bodies will rise again. It is an incredible thought, isn't it? That everyone who ever has lived in the past, throughout the world, throughout the centuries, will rise from the grave. But according to the Bible, some will rise to everlasting joy and some will rise to everlasting joy pain. Now, some question whether that is actually fair. How could it be right for people to suffer eternally for things they have done in a short period of time? Well, the reality is that the length of a sentence is not always proportionate to the time taken to commit a crime. We know that, don't we? There are some crimes in this world that you can commit that only take seconds. But the sentence can be life. 
When it comes to our sin against God, it is not the length that is the problem, it is the height that is the problem. And that is because ultimately, all the wrong things that we do, even against other human beings, ultimately, all the things that we do wrong are against God. The highly exalted, supremely glorious God who has created everything. You see, the great problem of our sin is not the length, it's the height. And therefore, because of our sin against God, we all deserve to experience everlasting shame because of how we've lived our lives. And yet, here's the great news. If you hear church for the first time, you might think, really, why have I come this morning hearing this news? Well, that is the background to the truth of the Bible, which is to say there is another way for your story to end. Because according to Daniel chapter 12, there are not just one eternal destination, there are two. Not everyone experienced the punishment that they deserve because we're told in Daniel 12 that some will rise to the joy of everlasting life in the presence of the everlasting God. Isn't that amazing? Let us not be confused about who these people are. These are not the good people. These are not the people that have lived a decent life and so earned uh, maybe a lovely place in the future. No, these are sinners who have come to Jesus, their Savior, and found salvation. Friends, that is the only difference between those who experience eternal joy and those who experience eternal suffering. It is not that one group are the good and the other group are the nasty, or that one group has earned some reward points by coming to church really often. No, the only reason that some people rise to everlasting joy is because in this life they have come to Jesus and they have been saved because of him. Jesus the Savior who died on a cross 2,000 years ago to suffer the punishment we deserve so that anybody who trusts in him will be fine. So let me ask you a question. Don't answer it out loud. Just think about it in your head. It's a critical question for you. Which list are you currently on? The truth is that there will be all sorts of lists that you want to get your name on in this life. But at the end of the day, when you consider where you will be in a thousand years' time, there are only two lists that ultimately matter. The list of those who are eternally saved and the list of those who are eternally lost. And therefore, my question this morning is this. Even if this is your first time in church or your first time watching online, which list are you on? And let us be crystal clear, the only way to get your name, and there is a way to get your name on the list of those who are saved, is by asking Jesus to be your Savior. But when you do, praise God, there is so much encouragement and comfort to come. So let me finish today with a word of encouragement and a word of exhortation. Or if you want me to use simpler language, what I mean is I'm going to finish with a word of comfort and a word of challenge. Uh, what's the word of encouragement and the word of exhortation. Well, it's there in verse 3. If you look at your Bibles, Daniel 12, verse 3, we're told that those who are wise, that is those who believe in God, Christians, uh, who trust in Jesus, will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. What's the word of encouragement? Those who have come to Jesus now, those who have put their faith in Jesus, will shine like the brightness of the heavens forever. Uh, that is a way of describing the bright future that awaits those who put their trust in Jesus Christ. Let me say to you, if you are a Christian, there are no promises that the journey will be smooth. In fact, the very reverse. However, the destination will be incredible. Okay, if you've ever been on a flight, you know, a flight was had a bit of turbulence, maybe some serious turbulence, and your stomach was going up and down, and you're holding on, and you're thinking, oh, I've got to protect me. It's this little seatbelt. And you arrive at your destination, and it's stunning. And you think, that was worth it. The journey's worth it if the destination is marvelous. That is a motivation to keep us going with Jesus, to keep you, if you are a Christian, sacrificing for the kingdom of Jesus Christ, sacrificing your money, your energy, all that you've got, not to be tempted to leave Jesus Christ and focus on other more comfortable pursuits and passions in your life that will cost you not as much. 
Because the Bible says that everything will be worth it at the end of the day. And don't we need the encouragements when it gets tough? In all factors of life, we need encouragements to keep on going. Um, through lockdown, as many of you know, I've been out jogging much more often. And sometimes I enjoy it, and sometimes it is really, really painful. Uh, the other day I was out, and I almost gave up halfway. I was sweating, I was tired, and I was on my way back, and I thought, oh, I don't really want to keep on going. Uh, do, you know what, do you know what kept me going? And this is really quite sad, actually. <laughs> I would promised myself an ice cream when I got home. Which, of course, is what you should do when you've just exercised in it. Uh, you know, unhealthy food, that's exactly the end result. But then I was huffing and puffing. And I thought, I had this vision of an ice cream <laughs> waiting me. And I come in through the front door. I don't really engage with my family because I have to get to the freezer for my ice cream. <laughs> that's a silly example. I know it is. But it does make a point, doesn't it, that we need encouragements to keep on going. And when there are more comfortable alternatives alongside us. Be encouraged if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be encouraged if you are finding it tough because the future is really bright and it will be worth it. But what about the word of challenge? Did you notice in verse 3 that those who are wise, that is those who believe in Jesus Christ, they don't simply hold on to Jesus. That's one thing that they do, but also they hold out the truth to other people. So that they lead, in the words of Daniel chapter 12, so that they lead other people to righteousness. That is, the wise, those who believe in Jesus, hold out the truth of Jesus Christ so that other people know the joy of being declared righteous by Jesus. That you're okay with God. Sometimes it is said that Christians can be so heavenly minded that they are of no earthly use. Ever heard that phrase? But the truth is actually the very reverse. Unless we are heavenly minded, we will not be any real use here on earth. Now that doesn't mean you should just like, gaze at the sky and listen to your Christian music. But it means you have a clear perspective on the future of eternity. And that enables you to live your life well now. So let me ask you this question. What do you want written on your gravestone? Uh, it's happy times, isn't it, if you come to church for the first time today. What do you want written on your gravestone? Uh, the other day, I took my oldest son, Josiah. Uh, we went out for kind of daddy-son time. Uh, so the first thing we did on daddy-son time is uh, we took a football and we had a little kick around. I have to remember that I'm 41 and, and he's eight. It's really hard, actually, because, you know, I should be better than him when he's eight, but he is eight. But we had a lovely time passing the ball, tackling each other. He wasn't too injured, so it was okay. That was part one. Do you know what we did next? We went to the cemetery. That's a good thing to do, isn't it? So we went for a walk in the cemetery. And as we walked through the cemetery, we looked at the gravestones. What a good dad I am. And we looked at the markings. What people had written about those who had died before. Now, what do you want on your grave? What do you want on yours that will describe what you were passionate about in life? Here are some options. What about this one? He was always busy. What about this one? He was always at the beach. What about this one? He liked to drink beer. Well, what about this one? He led many to righteousness. What about that, eh? Uh, he used or she used uh, her time. He used his money. Uh, he used his energy. She used her words. He used his home. He used his phone. He used whatever it takes to lead many to righteousness. Do you want that on your gravestone? That would be amazing, wouldn't it? Whatever else you've done to be known, that in this brief little life, we've used all that we've got to help other people arrive in heaven with us. So friends, what I want to encourage us today, whether you're online or in this barn, that is, do all we can with all we've got to leave a legacy that will last for eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that eternity is real. And we thank you that Jesus has died for us so that we can spend 
life with you forever. Help us not to waste our lives. Help us not to muck it up. But help us, Father, to have such a blazing view of eternity that we use this brief little life here on earth to prepare ourselves and others for life everlasting in your joyful presence forever.